I am sure if you're anything like me, you find the local development experience when building serverless applications a far cry from what you are used to with your typical development workflow. You might be used to starting up your application locally, stepping through it line by line using a debugger and having incredibly fast feedback loops as you're working completely within the constraints of your local machine. And then you move to AWS Lambda and you find that running and attaching a debugger locally is a little bit tricky. And then stepping through your code locally becomes more of a challenge. Well, fear not, .NET developers, because in this video, I'm going to give you not one, but two different strategies that you can use for locally testing and debugging your Lambda functions, giving you a development experience more akin to what you are familiar with. The beauty of these two strategies, they will work whatever framework you're using for deploying your Lambda functions. From SAM to CDK, Terraform to Pulumi, these strategies cover all of the bases. Without further ado, let's get straight into the first strategy. The experience many of you will be familiar with right now is simply hitting the debug button within your IDE, invoking your application and stepping through it line by line. But with Lambda, there isn't an application as such. And this can be a challenge, but actually, AWS has you covered here because there's a tool available called the .NET Mock Lambda Test Tool, a Blazor-based web application that allows you to debug your Lambda functions locally. And to install the tool, you can do that using the .NET CLI. If you come to this GitHub page, I will pop a link in the description below, of course. You can get all the instructions you need for installing and running the test tool, and it's actually installed as part of the .NET CLI. You can just run .NET tool install, install it globally with the dash G flag, amazon.lambda.testtool 6.0. And if you scroll back up through this GitHub repo, you can see the instructions for configuring this in whatever IDE it is you're choosing to use. I'm using JetBrains Rider, so I can go and have a look at the JetBrains Rider configuration instructions. And all I simply need to do is point my debugger at the actual Lambda test tool as the actual entry assembly. And then I set the working directory for my debug configuration to be the actual working directory for my Lambda project. If you come back over to JetBrains right now, you'll be able to edit these debug configurations using the configuration section up in the top right here. And if I edit my existing configurations, I already have one configured. And then you set up the executable path to the actual Blazor Lambda test tool. And then the working directory is of course set to the folder for my actual application, my actual Lambda function. And I've also got the option to set a whole bunch of different environment variables here. I'm setting any environment variables that might be set once this is actually deployed into AWS. So things like the name of the event bus, to publish events to the name of the Dynamo DB table, for example. These are all set as environment variables like they would be if this is actually running within AWS Lambda. So now that you've got your debug configuration set up, you can have a look at the project itself. There's two endpoints on this API. There's an endpoint for getting stock prices and an endpoint for setting stock prices. These are two separate Lambda functions. And you'll notice as part of the project, there are these two JSON files. It's these JSON files that the mock Lambda test tool will look for to be able to actually invoke your function. And you can see there's some pretty standard information in here, the region you want to use, what credential profile you want to use. And importantly, the actual function handler is really important. You get this right based on what your actual Lambda function handler is. You can have as many of these JSON files as you want. You'll need one for each individual Lambda function. Because I've got two Lambda functions in the same project, two endpoints, I need two separate JSON files. From here, I can now actually hit the debug button. So then it will actually open up a browser window so I can get in the browser and ready to work with this straight away. And you can see I've got these two configuration files for the get stock price endpoint and the set stock price endpoint. 
I've got the actual function handler. And if I switch my config file to the set stock price, I will then get the set stock price there. The credential profile is going to be dev. I'll put a link in the description for how to set up credential profiles on your machine and the region everything is deployed to is US East 1. I can then set a sample request to pass into my Lambda function. Now, this function is going to be fronted by API Gateway. So I'm going to use the API Gateway AWS proxy sample event. And I know if I go and look at my actual Lambda function code for my get stock price, the actual handler itself takes a stock symbol, a string as one of the parameters. That string is going to come from the path parameters. So if I come back to my test tool, I can set my path parameter to be stock symbol and my stock to be AMZ, for example. I'll then add a breakpoint in my actual Lambda function code back to the test tool. I can then hit the execute function button. That will drop me into my actual function code. I can step through this just like I normally would. And then I can just let that resume, come back to the test tool, and you will see the actual response being returned at the bottom there. This gives you the ability to be able to step through any function you want. If I change to my set stock price endpoint, I can load up my set stock price endpoint. I've already got a breakpoint there. I can execute that function. I will then hit my handler, let that run through, and this will actually return an error because I haven't actually set anything in the body of my request. The other thing that's really cool with the test tool is that you can actually save the request. So I could save this as, if I go back to my get stock price endpoint, I can actually save that as sample AMZ get request. And then I actually have that appears in my list of save requests. You can actually store these requests for use at a later date. It gives you that element of reusability between your different invokes. So that's the mock Lambda test tool. This allows you to debug your Lambda function locally and providing you've got your credentials profile set up correctly, you can then use that to debug, run through, and actually access resources that are actually deployed into the cloud. Now, the second method for actually debugging Lambda functions locally is actually my preferred method for testing and debugging locally. And that is actually using a testing framework as a harness for running your Lambda functions, whether that be a combination of unit tests and mock implementations or integration tests where you're going to execute your function handler locally. Now, of course, both the mock Lambda test tool and this integration test mechanism rely on you deploying resources into the AWS cloud. So if you're using things like DynamoDB and EventBridge, you first need to deploy the resources into your account that you can then actually access. It is, of course, possible to emulate AWS services locally on your machine. I wouldn't recommend doing that unless you are going to be on a plane with no internet connection for a few hours. So let's have a look at doing this using tests now. If you open up the unit tests project, and you can have a look at how this is going to work for mocking out and using unit tests. So this unit test, there's four unit tests here for testing the various different permutations of creating stock prices, depending on different feature flags. So this application called supports feature flags. And to do that, I'm using a test harness. And if you have a look at this mock test harness class, this is actually going to configure a dependency injection container. So I've actually got all the goodness of dependency injection that I can then use within my unit tests, just as this would if it was deployed into the AWS cloud. And I'm setting up mocks for my stock repository and mocks for my event bus. And I'm actually adding all of these mocks to my service collection, to my dependency injection container. And then of course, I'm adding the set stock price endpoint, the actual Lambda function as also as something in my dependency injection container. In my actual unit test then, I can create a new instance of my test harness and then get my set stock price endpoint from my dependency injection container. From there, I can actually run the set stock price endpoint and then you can just step through your code as normal. If I open up the test window in Rider and I debug one of these unit tests, this will then start up uh, my unit test, attach a debugger, this is going to use this mock test harness that I've created. And then as you can see, I can step through my function code. This is all using mocks. So I can step through this as I normally would, safe in the knowledge that this is all running completely independently within my machine. And you see the unit test passes.
Of course, this allows you to step through your application code using mock, so great for testing business logic, but what if you actually want to test the integration with a service like DynamoDB? And that's where you'll want to use integration tests. So if you open up the integration test project now, you see these tests are almost identical to the ones you've just looked at in the unit test project. Apart from this time, we're using a test harness, not a mock test harness. And what this actual test harness class is going to do is a very similar thing to the mock test harness. But instead of creating mocks of all the various AWS services, it's actually going to use the same dependency injection setup that your actual Lambda function is going to use and instead just use manually created versions of your AWS SDKs. So you can see here, I'm creating a DynamoDB client, creating an EventBridge client, and I'm creating that using an AWS credentials profile, again, called dev. So when this test harness sets up, it's going to create the SDKs using this custom credential profile from my machine, allowing me to run this code locally whilst accessing resources that have actually been deployed into my AWS account. If you go back to your tests and I run one of my integration tests, I'll run that same one that I ran last time. And I'm actually going to pop a breakpoint this time in my actual stock repository. And this is the actual application code that is actually going to run the queries against DynamoDB. So you'll see you've hit the breakpoint in the actual endpoint. And if I let that run through now, it's going to jump through my handler, jump through the feature flags, and then I'm going to hit the actual interaction with DynamoDB. And of course, if I step over this now, that's going to return successfully because I've set up that credentials profile. I have permissions to access these different resources. Let that run through now. Don't hit stop. Let that run through again, just to prove that that is actually going to work and you'll see that integration test has completed successfully. That has now run a test against an actual resource in my actual AWS account. And if I come over to my AWS account now and actually look at the table here, you see that I have some resources that have been created in my DynamoDB table. This might sound great, but you might now be thinking, James, my entire organization shares a single AWS account. How the heck can I do this in a situation where there's multiple developers in the same account? And that's where Postfix is coming. Postfix allows you to create a CloudFormation stack and all the resources within it and add a additional Postfix at the end of the name. So you'll see in my AWS account here, I've got my stock price table and I've also got the stock price table dash JE. Looking at the CDK code that used, I used to deploy this, I actually pull a Postfix from an environment variable called stack Postfix. This is what will allow me to create resources using something that's specific to me. I can set an environment variable on my machine, in this instance, to dash JE. Then I can deploy the resources and I'll get a full set of resources that use the dash JE Postfix. Looking at my integration test code, now you'll see in the setup for my test harness, I'm doing the exact same thing. I'm reading that same stack postfix environment variable and using that when I actually set up my table name and my event bus name and all my settings, I'm adding on that postfix. If I come over to my terminal now and actually go into the test, it's in my terminal here where I've set the postfix and I run a .NET test now, this is going to use the postfix. You see, I still get four past tests, which is fantastic. And all of them tests will have run against my Postfix stack. You can see that there because I've now got an AMZ stock symbol in my stock price table that is Postfix. So using things like Postfixing allows you to have multiple developers all working within the same AWS account using completely different resources, which means you won't get collisions between multiple developers running tests at the same time or conflicting with CI CD pipelines, you have this capability to have independent resources within the same AWS account. Now, of course, in an ideal world, every single developer will have their own sandbox AWS account, but of course, that's not always the case. So what I've shown you there are two different strategies for testing and debugging your Lambda functions locally. Of course, Although you're debugging locally, you're stepping through the code locally, both options require you to deploy some element of resources into the AWS cloud and be able to set up a credentials profile that 
allows you to access them resources that you've just deployed. But using things like post fix stacks will allow your entire development team to share a single AWS account without conflicting with each other. That's one of the biggest recommendations I can give you is to test against actual cloud resources. Unless you're unit testing and using mocks, get things in the cloud, test against actual cloud resources. And unless you're somewhere you can't access the internet, like a plane or a train, try and avoid emulation wherever possible. Use strategies like these I've demonstrated today to be able to step through and debug your code. That's all for this video. If you've liked, please like, please subscribe, ding that little notification bell, and I will see you all in the next video.